The wicked flee no, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. When I think of being bold as a lion, I can't help but to think about our brothers and sisters in the early church. They were tortured. They were fed to lions. They were despised. They were mocked. And yet, they were as bold as a lion. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. We're going to mostly be in Acts chapter 4 this morning. And... The early church, they boldly proclaimed two proclamations. Number one, that Jesus indeed resurrected from the dead. And number two, that Jesus is the one and only way. And these are two proclamations that in our day are becoming less and less popular. And third, in Acts chapter 4, we're going to look at, well, how did the disciples acquire this boldness to proclaim these two radical proclamations? In Acts chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The message of the resurrection, it was intrusive to the religious leaders in Jesus' day. You know, the, the, the priests, of course, were the religious teachers. The, the captain of the temple guard, these were essentially the policemen of the time. And then the Sadducees, they were one of the sects of Judaism in which they only held to the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. They didn't consider the rest of the books of of our Old Testament as the Word of God. They only held to the first five, so therefore they didn't believe in any type of spiritual world or resurrection from the dead or anything like that. And the Bible says that they were greatly disturbed when the apostles, well, why were they proclaiming the resurrection of the dead? Because Jesus resurrected. Critics of the Bible will say, well, how, was Je how was Jesus dead three days? If you look historically, Jesus died on Passover Friday, which was about 3 p.m. He resurrected Sunday morning around dawn. And, and, and in the Western world, that's not even two days. It's a day and a half. Contradiction. Not so quickly, my friend. How the Jews kept track of time, one hour would be considered a full day. So Jesus was dead on Friday. He was dead Saturday. And he was dead Sunday morning. And so he was dead three days. And here the apostles, they're proclaiming that Jesus resurrected from the dead. And, and this is critical because Paul says, if Jesus didn't resurrect, then we are without hope and we are dead in our sins. The cross is irrelevant without the resurrection. The resurrection is what completes the cross. One of the greatest evidences of the resurrection is the lives of the apostles. These were men that when Jesus was arrested, they ran away and they were terrified. They were fearful. They were cowardly. And here all of a sudden they had this extreme boldness to go out and proclaim the resurrection. And if you look historically at their lives, they became martyrs. Peter was crucified upside down. 
One of the apostles was filleted. Matthias, if I'm not mistaken, who replaced Judas Iscariot. These men were, they died horrific deaths because they were convinced that Jesus resurrected from the dead. How should our lives look if Jesus indeed raised from the dead? How ought we to live if Jesus indeed resurrected from the dead? You know, Peter and John, it's fascinating to look at them through the Bible because we know that, you know, Peter, he was, uh, he was, obviously Peter and John, they were both close to Jesus, but Peter was this guy that you see him with Jesus and he's, hey, we, he seemed like the guy that made the big mistakes. But then when, when you look into 1 Peter, years and decades later, even after this, these events in Acts chapter 4, he says, as a fellow elder, Peter, from where he was at, fearful, young, to being an older man, he was an elder. John, one of the sons of thunder, he wanted Jesus to call down fire on the people. The resurrection took him to, he was known as what? The apostle of love. That's the power of the resurrection. In verse, in verse 5, the next day the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Ananias the high priest was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is, and he quotes Psalm 18, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There's a book called The Case for Christ. And maybe some of you have read it. And, and Lee Strobel, he, the author of the book, he was a journalist for the Chicago Tribune. He was an incredible journalist. And his wife comes home one day and she essentially says, hey, I believe in the Bible, I'm going to church. So he begins this journey of investigating. He travels the country interviewing all these uh, theologians and, and biblical scholars and all these New Testament professors to essentially prove his wife's conviction wrong. And when it all, when it all is said and done, he too believes that, hey, the Bible is the truth. But in this journey, though, he discovered that the early church had a creed. Stay in Acts chapter 4, but turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This was a creed in the early church from the earliest time of the first century church. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 3, and of course Paul was writing the letter here and he says, for what I received, I passed on to you. So this phrase, I received, I passed on to you, this is rabbi terminology. Paul saying, I didn't teach this. I didn't start this. I received this. This is what I was taught. And now I'm passing it on to you. And this was a creed in the early church, according to scholars. On to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to, to Cephas, that's Peter's Aramaic name, the name he had before Jesus changed his name, Cephas. And then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at that same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. 
And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Their creed was all about the resurrection. Is the resurrection transforming you? Does the resurrection have power in your life? It's a historical fact that Jesus resurrected. You know how long the Romans and, and people who were against the church looked and searched for Jesus' body? For years. And they didn't find anything. And they're not going to find anything. Because Jesus resurrected from the dead. And Peter makes it clear to those of the Sanhedrin in verse 5, the rulers and elders and the teachers of law, they formed the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish Supreme Court. And Peter wants to be clear with them that Jesus is the only way. He's not a way. He's the only way. That's becoming more and more and more unpopular. Too judgmental. Too narrow-minded. The only way? Jesus. It's interesting. A survey was taken recently of people who attend church, regardless of denomination, people who attend church. And it was young people, ages 18 to 39. And over 60% of them do not believe that Jesus is the only way. They believe that Muhammad and Buddha, they're equal paths to salvation as well. Doesn't matter who you choose, they're all equal. It's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Jesus is the way, the only way. You know, it. Up until the temple was destroyed in around 70 A.D. when the Romans came in and destroyed the temple, up until then, the, the disciples, they were considered just a sect of Judaism. And they preached this message so often and so much about Jesus being the only way that they were given the name The Way. That's what they were referred to, The Way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Peter's saying, listen, Jesus is the only way to salvation. It's only through the cross. There's no other way to salvation except through Jesus' blood, through Jesus' resurrection. It's the cross. In verse 13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. It was the boldness, the courage that astonished the Sanhedrin about the apostles. And these guys, they were flabbergasted because they're looking for an explanation. It's like, okay, these guys, they're unschooled. In other words, that word in Greek is like idiotos, which we get our English word idiot from. And not idiot in the sense of like, you know, crazy, lunatic, but just in the sense of, in our terminology, they don't have a theology degree. They didn't go to divinity school. They don't have this, this rigorous religious training as the rabbis. They're unschooled. And this astonished them that they had such a boldness without this schooling. And it says, they took note that these men had been with Jesus. That was the only explanation. That was the only thing. Is like, there's other, other, they were with Jesus. When you spend time with Jesus and you walk with Jesus and the resurrection impacts your life, it cannot be denied. 
Your life can't be denied when the resurrection takes root of it. In verse 14, But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there were nothing they could say. There was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them not to speak no longer to anyone in his name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. You can't help but to speak about what you have seen and heard. The apostles witnessed the resurrection. They couldn't help but to just go out and speak about it. Us, we witness the resurrection. When someone becomes a disciple of Jesus, that's witnessing the power of the resurrection. When you see someone come from darkness and, and, and living in the world and living a sinful life, and you see that person's heart change, and they're a disciple of Jesus, that's You've witnessed the power of the resurrection. Look at your own life. Think of your life before you became a disciple. Think about how you were. That's the power of the resurrection. Verse 23. It says, On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke to the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. He's quoting Psalm chapter 2. It's interesting here that Peter and John, they go back and they, they report to the brothers and sisters what happened. The threats they received, everything that had happened. It's important that we share our lives with one another. The apostles could have easily said, you know what? We got a lot of people that are baby Christians. They just got baptized. Let's not scare them. Let's not scare them. They went back and say, this is what happened. And you know what happened? They all prayed together. <laughs> they prayed together. When I know what's going on with you, I can pray for you. When you know what's going on with me, you can pray for me. And they went back and they prayed together. And let's read on. Verse 27, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy, your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. How did they acquire this boldness? Through prayer. It was through prayer. They came together and they prayed, and the Bible says the place that they prayed, it was shaken. Then they were filled with the Spirit after they prayed. Prayer is a superpower. And, and, and I, I underestimate it. And we can underestimate the power of prayer. It's a superpower. 
If you can say a prayer, raise your hand. So we're all capable of acquiring this boldness to make these proclamations about Jesus. This word boldly in the Aramaic is the word glia, and it's best defined as what you see is what you get. I thought that was humorous. What you see is what you get. It's interesting because when you look at prayer in the Hebrew, it means to judge and to reconcile. You may, well, let me explain. Prayer from the ancient times, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people understood, prayer is to judge. In other words, it's to, we go before God to judge our hearts before God. That's what we're doing. That, that's prayer. God, what do we do? We say, God, my, right now I have a, I have a bad attitude. My heart's bad. Help me to have a right heart, God. What are we doing? We're judging ourselves before God. And then what does God do? God reconciles to reconcile. God reconciles us with him through that. So prayer, that to judge, to reconcile in the Hebrew, then the Aramaic, the Aramaic, what you see, the boldness, what you, what you get is what you see. Excuse me. What you see is what you get. You see that? It was through prayer. Jesus resurrected. You know, the tombs of Buddha and Muhammad are bones and ashes. But our hope is in that empty light-filled tomb of Jesus. And that is our one and only sure hope eternal life. 